Um, I just want to kick off, as I often do at the beginning of any sort of workshop that I run, um, by actually showing this map here. And I would love for you to just take a second and think how old you were when you first saw this map. Um, and, you know, many of you will have heard me tell the story that my first recollection of this is in primary school, having to memorize the capital cities that went along with the states. Um, and how I want to sort of move along here is actually by showing this map here. And I'd love for you to think about how old you were when you saw this map. Um, for most people, when I ask this question, it's significantly later than when we saw this first map here. Um, but what I find fascinating is that this map is so much older. In fact, hundreds of thousands of years older. For those of you that might not be familiar, this is a map of our Indigenous peoples here in Australia. And before we kick off our live learning series today, I just want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you from Brisbane on Yagara and Turrbal land. And um, whilst we're going to talk about innovation moving forward, particularly in innovation, um, I want us to also think about, in education, sorry, I want us to also think about that the best innovation comes from deeply understanding our past. And we have so much richness um, in order to gain from our Indigenous peoples and the amazing history that we have in our culture. And so I want to start by acknowledging that and paying my respects to that um, before we move forward. Um, for those of you that might not know me, my name is Nick Dyson and I am the future, uh, the CEO, I can't speak today, the founder of Future Anything. And um, look, this is kind of my front facing profile, a little bit like this. Um, but I have to admit that most of the time as a founder of an organisation, I look a little bit more like this, which is, you know, a little bit of snot hanging out of my nose, kind of like flying by the seat of my pants, or in this case, um, you know, holding onto a parachute in the sky. Um, and before I was uh, the founder of Future Anything, I was a teacher in the classroom. And um, for me, the classroom looked a lot like this, um, a little bit black and white, um, and very much like what education looked like when I was a student. And as a classroom teacher, I started to ask the question of what could we do to make curriculum link to learning in the real world? And so from there, I actually created Future Anything, which is a curriculum embedded entrepreneurship program in schools. And this year we're working with close to 4,000 students around the country. And why have we created this live learning series? Well, in short, I guess to provide an opportunity for educators to tap into some really powerful voices in the education space, some doers, some change makers, some experts and some leaders who are looking at how we can do education differently in order to set people up for the, set young people up for the future of work. Um, and so we're going to be sort of tweeting along the way. So if you've got socials, um, we'd love for you to use live learning series, the hashtag, and kind of share your insights as we're moving along. Um, I'm going to invite our first guest for today to switch their camera on for us so that we can introduce her. She rarely needs an introduction, um, but Jen, thanks for joining us today as our first feature human in our live learning series. It's awesome to have you here. Hi, Nick. Great to be here. I think that was my cue. How are you? you. Um, <laughs> Excellent to be here and I love that you're doing live learning. It's like what used to be lunch box learning or something. Lunchtime learning is now live learning. So great. <laughs> Look, in, in the age of Zoom, um, we're just going to beam learning into homes and offices all around Australia. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to tap into with the live learning series was kind of unpack um, some of the things that are happening in education at the moment and then maybe sort of unlock ways that we can move forward in the education space. Um, before we sort of dig into that stuff, maybe tell us a little bit about like the work that you've done in the past rather than me read a, a long amazing bio and maybe I know we did this debrief before we jumped on screen but what's some of the work that you're digging into at the moment? Uh, yes, so um, what's the best way to summarise a couple of decades of work? I guess I've spent um, a lot of my time working with young people and kind of at the intersection of um, lots of issues, not just education and learning, but also 
um, out of home care and youth homelessness and employment and unemployment, but also youth entrepreneurship and leadership. So through a range of different jobs um, and roles, including founding a few organisations along the way, um, I've just had the incredible privilege of working kind of at the front line with young people, um, originally as a young person, and then I got older and kept working with young people, which is great. Um, plus, I guess I'm also, um, uh, you know, have a really, I guess, very personal experience of being um, a mother of three children and two foster children and two kind of adopted children into our family. So have a huge sort of tribe of family members who all now are in their kind of 20s and have been through really diverse experiences in education and learning. It's kind of a good insight um, when you look at your own family actually as well. And then in the last year, um, I stepped out of kind of CEO roles for the first time in several decades. And I've been doing kind of strategic advisory work with other CEOs, which has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and a lot of strategy, a lot of thinking about systemic change, um, also leading, co-leading uh, Learning Creates Australia with Tony Mackay and Hayley Maguire, and then also um, running a podcast called New Work Bites um, about future of work. So not a lot. That enough? That's enough. You're obviously not busy at all, just kind of sipping tea um, and enjoying yourself. I'd love to dig into the Learning Creates work a little bit more because it's such an interesting body of work. Um, and this is obviously something that you've embarked on for a little over 12 months now, but the momentum for Learning Creates has been building for a significant length of time with your work in the Foundation for Young Australians. Tell me why that why Learning Creates exists and, and what it's working towards bringing such a huge number of amazing stakeholders together. Yeah, well, there's a few people on this um, on this video as well who are actually involved. So <laughs> it's great to see them here. But um, I, this work really came out of our work at uh, Foundation for Young Australians over five years of doing research on the new work order and producing seven reports on the future of work and young people, which all those reports actually led us back to education and what was happening in education learning environments for young people. It's kind of inevitable and um, also very powerful because I think that being able to look at the horizon and then see actually where the change needed to happen was very powerful. Um, and so although we'd done a few different things in education, a lot of programmatic like $20 Boss, as you know well, Nick, and other programs, um, we felt that it was really important to try and do some of the kind of coalition building that we've seen in other places around the world, like Canada and the UK and New Zealand and Estonia. Um, and it's not that there hasn't been coalition building before around education, there has and there is. Um, but we wanted to see what it would look like if we brought that kind of alliance of people that we had been working with over several years from employers to government policy people to educators and particularly young people, which is kind of front and centre, obviously, to what FYA was interested in if we brought that group together. Um, and so we did, and with some support from the largest philanthropic foundation in Australia, um, we spent a good year kind of scoping and thinking about what we might do, um, and then launched Learning Creates Australia a year ago now, um, with a very express purpose to um, look at one challenge question. There were many things we wanted to do, Nick, obviously, um, but we decided that we would focus on kind of the learner's journey and what it would look like to have um, a new journey for learners in, through and out of school and what those pathways might look like and a particular question. Um, which Michelle and Lynn and Sarah and other people know here very well, which was, um, you know, what would it take for us to recognise and value all forms of learning and also to have a better understanding about how we might make that learning uh, kind of trusted and valued, not just in education systems, but also beyond education systems into school, into work, what parents would value, what employers would value, and also what young people would value as their learning. Um, and in that time, we obviously saw some other reports that were released like Beyond Data and others. 
resources which have helped um, move this conversation forward. Um, and then we kind of brought a unique methodology. So we teamed up with um, PwC, the Impact Assembly, just kind of worked all over the world with a methodology called Social Labs, which again is um, trying to bring people together to uh, work in a very different way um, from community level through to kind of system level, uh, using a lab model to prototype um, and uh, design new ideas and then test them with communities. So this year, um, after spending time looking at learners' journeys and coming at this from a learner perspective in the last 12 months, this year we're focusing on uh, what, that, what those learners have told us and how we might uh, prototype some new ideas for recognition of learning. And we're working with about six really amazing communities across the country and we've got a national lab team of about 50 people and then there's about another 500 people involved in learning creates australia through panels um, support groups um, and our kind of network so yeah it's very exciting work um, where the clock is against us we kind of have this year to get to the end of the year with some designs that could be implemented but um you know it's obviously a really significant opportunity and the time feels right, COVID included, to think about how we might recognise learning um, and privilege young people's ways of learning and knowing differently. Yeah, and I think I'd love to dig into that because obviously, you know, for, for people like yourself and people like me that are working in the innovation space and education, it's quite easy to understand why education needs to be different. But if we kind of look back at the large volume of research, both produced by the Foundation for Young Australians and other research that's coming out continuously, what's the why for doing education differently? Why is it so important for us to be revisiting what education looks like for a young person today compared to the education experience that, you know, yourself and I and other people have had in generations before? Why now? Why different? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, education is, uh, as an institution, is a kind of a mirror of society, I think. And our society is in the most significant transition. Um, you know, we, we started calling out the fourth industrial revolution about 10 years ago. And ever since then, um, those, I guess, um, real kind of milestones, not milestones, but like, kind of signals have got stronger and stronger and stronger around the changing nature of work, um, the absolutely catastrophic um, changes to climate that we're seeing that again were called out, but now we're seeing the, the implications of that call out, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, inequality and growing inequality in the world. We've never had a time where, you know, the top 1% of the world have been so far ahead in terms of their income and their lifestyles and their power uh, to the middle and the and sort of working classes ever in the history of time. So, you know, it seems that if education is a is a mirror, but also education is the kind of lever for how you um, create equity in a society, the, the external environment is really calling on education to step up. Um, and I think we often in education learning kind of a very insular. We look forward, we look into our classroom, we look at the children and young people in front of us, which is 100% right. I mean, how can you not look at the children and young people in front of you? But that's to misunderstand the power of education in the broader society and in the future of decisions that we make. And, you know, learning creates Australia was a really conscious decision um, in the title and we agonised over it but we genuinely believe that um, if we're to have equity and if people are to have um, opportunity and if we're to develop as a society with all the things that are coming at us including opportunities by the way like huge opportunities um, then we need to understand how education is core to that and equitable education is core to that and the decisions that we make you know I've been reading I read Michael Fullan's latest paper twice today <laughs> Um, and, you know, about the right drivers for system, whole system um, success. And, you know, the, the real, again, the call outs that have been accelerated or amplified in COVID, Nick, around wellbeing. And he's now tied wellbeing and learning 
you know, intrinsically together. And that's right. I mean, we know that there is no learning without well-being. And we know that well-being begets great learning. So, you know, there are some really strong themes in that report or that paper that I think is so powerful for where we are now. Um, and he does talk about equity and he does talk about social intelligence. He does talk about systemness and the fact that system change doesn't take place just at the kind of echelons of power and director generals. It takes place everywhere through the system. And I think that's what Learning Creates is really trying to do. We're really trying to say that everywhere in the system, it is actually an ecosystem. It's not actually a hierarchical top-down system. It's an ecosystem where everybody has ownership about their part of the system. But what we need to do is collaborate more effectively and join up that system. Yeah. Um, it is an ecosystem around education. And we obviously talk from the macro level and the micro level and, and the, that echelons of systems change as much as like the classroom experience, you know, with the teacher, with learners. If we look at some of the best examples, both nationally and internationally on a macro level, thinking about systems that are maybe stepping up, if we use your phrase before, where is education being done well, even in pockets of greatness? <laughs> Listen, there are pockets of greatness everywhere. Um, we call them points of light. Um, and our challenge, of course, is to kind of join the po points of light into a lighthouse um, so that it can genuinely guide the way for a, a future society. But, you know, I think some of the most amazing work with First Nations groups, for instance, has been done in New Zealand and, and um, in Canada. So we look to those um, countries for, you know, fantastic work that recognises that learning has been um, passed down through millennia, <laughs> through, you know, community to community and um, in very different ways. I think the other places that we look at are interesting places like Estonia that decided to, uh, in the last couple of years, completely um, connect their entire country and every student through um, the internet and infrastructure. And that's, you know, sounds like, oh, of course, everyone has that. Of course, you know, places like Singapore have that, but it's a stark reminder to us here in Australia that 2.5 million people um, in this country every day don't have regular access to the internet. And that includes students. So, you know, things that we think uh, would be unacceptable in Australia actually happen. Um, and here there's other countries that have actually stepped into that. Um, I think across the US, there are various examples of new schools and new models and the same in the UK. Um, and then we're also seeing in places like, you know, India, um, people like Vishal with Dream the Dream and just, you know, very innovative and clever ways of distributing education and learning <laughs> that are, um, you know, obviously really, really in difficult situations. And I think that kind of innovation and thinking, but I have to say, Nick, that it's nothing like the rate or the pace of innovation in every other industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're about to, in Australia, probably get two of the largest renewable projects, one in the top end um, renewables and focus on, you know, the biggest project in the Southern Hemisphere, probably in renewables um, out of the NT, like really leading edge work. Um, and innovative and a lot of R&D and a lot of alliances across government and corporate and community. Um, we, we're not seeing that in, in Australia around education. We're seeing it in other industries. And by the way, those industries are pushing for us to be more innovative. Mm -hmm. But it seems to us that innovation is really important in education and learning um, here and globally. And not to say we don't have great work happening in Australia because we do and in communities that we've in contact with across Tassie and, and NT and WA and New South Wales there are, there are incredible schools doing incredible work but we're not getting that systemness that we talked about and that Michael Fullen talks about um, across and through the, the whole system as yet. And what are the blockers, Jen? Like, why are other industries seeing that rapid adoption of innovation and that fast prototyping and implementation of new? What are the barriers and blockers for our education system? What's stopping us replicating that? Uh, well, I think that we focus on it's, I mean, Michael Fullen talked about 
talks about this as well, about we focus on the wrong things. So, you know, when he wrote the report on the wrong drivers of system change, which was almost doomed to failure because to sort of go out there with the wrong drivers rather than a positive message that we could aspire to that had kind of intrinsic motivation in it was kind of difficult but he you know they talked a lot about the wrong drivers but now he talks about the kind of bloodless paradigm and then the human paradigm and he talks about the bloodless paradigm which is very twilight zone-esque I guess um, where he talks about you know the obsession with academics and he says that these things are not to be in competition so whilst the human paradigm says wellness you know well-being and learning it's not versus academic obsession it's just in relation to it's like what's the right balance and so um, in the bloodless paradigm you know he thinks that academic obsession by itself is a lever that has been pulled that is not actually serving students in that now. Um, things like machine intelligence, if we were to start relying on AI as kind of the teaching tool rather than the interaction, the relationships and the, the, the learning together, um, then we're not actually using our social intelligence, which is limitless and very powerful for us. And in fact, a lot of people say that we're not anywhere near our full human potential. So why would we give away power to machines? Yeah. Um, and then we've got obviously, um, you know, an austerity agenda globally, which also works against equity and equality. And we also have, um, you know, another one of his bloodless paradigms is sort of the fragment fragmentation that leads to inertia. If the system's really fragmented, it's very hard to see where the join ups in and where the opportunities are. So um, that's why systemness in relation to systemness is really important. So I love that he's put these kind of the bloodless paradigm, but he's not actually saying that we shouldn't have those things. He's just saying they need to be well um, modelled against the kind of human paradigm. So going forward, how we much more effectively think about um, the changes that we need to make using both these things in, in, our, um, in our power. So, and then finally, I think the systemness was the most exciting to me because it's very much mirrors what we're doing with Learning Creates, which is um, you don't just sort of go top down or bottom up or inside out. It actually says that every part of the system has an absolutely essential role, but it needs to understand how it connects and can work and collaborate more effectively. And I think there's much power in that, Nick, that, you know, I think before we've sort of tried to see things in compartments and then tried to kind of glue them together or jam them together when they just don't make sense. And Michael says that about wellbeing and learning. We've got an entire movement around cell, social emotional learning. Um, and I have always shared his unease with that. It's a different thing to learning, but in fact, it's not. It's actually a core part of education and learning. Mm. And I'm going to ask two more questions and then we'll um, throw to the floor if anybody's got some questions. So if you've got one, you, you're welcome to pop it in the chat or in a moment we'll give you an opportunity to jump in live and ask that question. We've sort of talked a little bit about that systems level change and some of those barriers and blockers to pulling those levers, I guess, of innovation. Um, if you're a teacher and you're listening to this and you've got, you know, as a primary school teacher, your one class of young people this year or as a secondary teacher, maybe your five classes, what might be two or three things that you think are important to double down on as a classroom educator? Maybe some small initiatives that you can run um, or different processes or different ways of running a classroom that will, I guess, edge your young people a little bit closer towards where they need to be. Yeah, well, I think, I think every um, educator actually does know about these kind of 12 global competencies. Um, you know, they're a set of skills like creativity and critical thinking and things we've always talked about Nick and which you're doing with Future Anything. There's sort of elements of character, you know, curiosity, courage, leadership, ethics. There's sort of meta-learning, metacognition and kind of growth mindset. So it doesn't matter what level you're at in school, every single student should, those 12 competencies should be kind of front and centre. Now, we've got them in the general capabilities of our curriculum, but what was interesting was when Fulham did the, their, their team did the research across 22 jurisdictions across the world, and although almost every jurisdiction said, yes, we're, you know, we've got those in our capabilities or we've got those in our manifesto, they were not actually being genuinely assessed. 
And so they were not actually making up the story of the young person. And what we heard all year last year from young people and also what I heard all through my time with Create Foundation, FYA, every single engagement with young people in every organisational context and individually was we are not being seen as a whole person for what we know and can do. Um, and that's what we're asking for. We're asking to be seen for what we know and can do and to have that assessed alongside the kind of academic um, process that we're involved in. And by the way, we believe that academic process can be made much more um, effective for a whole broader range of learners through inquiry-based learning and so on. So um, I think that's a really key thing that every educator actually has permission in the Australian context to go hard after those 12 competencies. They're, they're articulated, they're in our system already. Um, and then I think that um, I, there's a huge opportunity that I believe that we're missing, which is uh, for students and educators um, to kind of join forces. I've noticed a new generation of educators coming out. Um, probably, you know, a lot of people kind of led by people like you, Nick, but there is a new generation coming through. And I think the collaboration, I think the kind of division between student and educator um, is blurring a lot more. And I see a lot more two-way learning. I see a lot more interest and curiosity in different ways of teaching. And I firmly believe that actually educators and students will lead the kind of change um, by being very courageous in the things that they're doing, but also very uh, clear about how we measure and, and assess those things that have been doing and what kind of new success looks like. And also how those things are linked to the real world. Because as you know, my obsession is, um, Yes, learning, absolutely, and a huge belief in learning and experimentation and curiosity, but I also want for young people to see a path through to how I might use this um, in a range of diverse environments, as we know, 17 jobs in five different industries across a lifetime. Um, we're going to need to think really broadly about careers. Mm. And I think, you know, if I think back to my schooling, um, you know, having to research for an assignment, you'd be given like history, the question, and I used to go to the library and pull off the encyclopedia and whoo, dust it off. And, you know, finding information was arduous and challenging. And so the assessment around research tasks was around, I guess, your ability to synthesize from those texts in a library. Um, it's so different now for young people, as far as being able to regurgitate an answer to a question, it's about three seconds away for them. At, at no point in their life will any young person sit in exam conditions in silence where they don't have access to a piece of technology where they can find the answer to the question. So regurgitating mm -hmm. the content is no longer paramount for success moving forward in their careers. For our young people, we need them to be able to collaborate. We need them to think critically. We need them to be able to discern from the mass amount of content and media that they have access to, who should I listen to and, and who should I not listen to um, and be curious and be creative um, and, and problem solve. So, um, you know, as much as our assessment, particularly in that senior space focuses on, you know, marking young people on their ability to regurgitate information in the right order, that unfortunately that's not going to serve those young people when they leave school because they're not ever going to be in a space where they're going to be tested on that skill. Um, I'd love to throw, we've got a question here from Natasha, and if anybody else has got a question, please jump in, either a comment um, in the chat or feel free to raise your hand and I can jump to. If you haven't used Zoom before, um, you can hit the reactions bottom and then uh, in the bottom uh, bar and then obviously raise your hand. But Natasha wants to know, are there any tips on building an ecosystem? So how do you bring the world of work into schools and vice versa? Almost um, making transparent the barrier between the school gates. Yeah, I mean, there's some fantastic work in Australia on this, I must say. Um, and there's kind of system level versions of it, which are things like tech schools and so on, which are in Victoria, there's quite a few of them now, uh, where they have expressly um, been established to bring students into the world of work and the world of work into students. They're almost like a meeting place for that. Um, but then there's other organisations who've been in this space for 20 years, like Beacon Foundation, who have consistently brought millions of young people into contact with um, 
with employers and employers on people and just had that kind of whole process going on, Natasha. Um, so yeah, Beacon are great. <laughs> and one of our partners in Learning Creates and a, and a partner at, when I was at FIA. So, um, and FIA did a lot of that work. I think the issue is the same issue though, Natasha, which is how do we make that part of the kind of system? So there's a lot of conversation, as you all know here, going on about, um, career advice, career learning, career education, uh, VET in Victoria just had a big review. Um, and so we've got to get a kind of a 21st century version of all those things happening um, and get beyond the kind of um, idea that you have to have this kind of career educator person who's the font of all knowledge and will tell you what your career should be because we're a long way from that now, let alone in the future. So I can see a much more integrated, um, if VET or kind of models like VCAL were really powerful, we would have this seamless from early high school all the way through this seamless connection. Um, and it would be work integrated learning. It wouldn't be work experience. It wouldn't be career advice. It wouldn't be career placements. It would be work integrated learning. So the things you're studying in school and inquiry-based learning, and I think big picture do this actually best probably in the world. The things that you're studying and working on, you're going out into industry to just discover and find out more and to try those things rather than a random, and I promise you this happened to me a lot and I did this, ringing up your friends on Sunday night and saying, can my kid come to work experience for you this week? They need a placement. Um, and unfortunately, I think some of that still goes on. So the demands of the future world of work and the demands of employers is actually young people who have had some engagement and had work integrated learning over a period of time are going to be much, much, much more uh, effective as they as they become new entrants into the workforce and um, they're going to be able to do more and do more more quickly because of that experience rather than being a real fish out of the water which is what many of them say now. I think um, what's really curious I remember being a classroom teacher and, and wanting to sort of uh, break down those barriers between the organizations that were working outside the school and obviously the young people that are in my classroom and there were a couple of, I guess, assets that I completely ignored as a classroom teacher. And, and one of those was, you know, the alumni of the school that I attended, students who had been to the school and then graduated and were now in the world of work, um, yeah. utilising that amazing platform to come back and give to their school community. Because, you know, the comment that these young people often make um, in adulthood is, I wish I had that when I was at school. So providing an opportunity for those voices to come back and engage young people is often very powerful. And then the second element was actually just reaching out to the parents of the young people in your classroom. And, um, you know, more than I couldn't count the number of times in my career that I would send just an email out saying, hey, this is the topics that we're covering for this term. Um, does anyone know anyone that works in these industries or fields? And would you be willing to give up an hour of your time to share your expertise with young people? And again, the comment that I had over and over um, from parents and, and caregivers was, oh, I wish I had this opportunity when I was at school. So the opportunity to give back is something that a lot of people genuinely want to invest in because they know the value of that real life experience for young people in the classroom. So the ecosystem is often, you know, one degree of separation from the young people you're teaching in the classroom. Um, feel free to throw any other questions in here as well. Oh, hey, Rob, how are you? Um, so, <laughs> loved the discussion on the pace of innovation. Thoughts on how the actual structure of school allows for innovation. Um, surely breaking down these structural paradigms would allow for more innovation to occur within the education sector. Um, so... Rob by Tanya, I guess, what are some of the ways that school is being done differently from a structural point of view, Jan? What have you seen and are there opportunities or greater opportunities for innovation when we break down some of those norms? Yeah, I mean, I think we have got um, examples of schools being done differently. And as I think I mentioned, um, tech, you know, tech high certainly is going very well in the US and big picture um, also here. Um, our school alumni, thanks Michelle Anderson. <laughs> All that's uh, dropping in now, which is great. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think there are 
um, a whole lot of ways. I, I think, Rob, the issue is, and I'm very keen on the group's view about this, the issue is that these are not considered kind of the norm in how we should organise going forward. Um, and so, and even if it was, okay, well, we all agree this is how it should go be organised going forward, we would then set out on a path towards that. But right now, that's not what's happened. These are still seen as the exceptions to the rules. Mm. Um, and so I think that's our challenge. And so, you know, with Learning Creates, uh, we've come at this from a different perspective, to be perfectly frank, as you all know here, I think that we've basically said, listen, let's try and understand how we recognise learning in all its diverse ways and then how we might, you know, give it utility and value and trust. Um, and let's come at this from a student-centred perspective rather than necessarily from a system perspective. Now, there's an, there's an assumption in there that that might help move the system and that that's a lever to move the system um, but whichever way I think we can't go wrong if we put students at the centre of this and kind of build out from there and as I said that's why I think there's a lot of educators who are super interested in doing this and excited about doing it um, particularly um, you know in the group that are coming through and starting starting in teaching um, and education and there are obviously some brilliant principals around the country who are um, also feeling stronger about you know, that autonomy that has been given to many of them to think about doing things differently um, so we'll will for instance a new recognition and assessment learning system that kind of replaces data over time um, that kind of improves the way that we think about recognition learning will that help provide what you're talking about which is kind of the innovation and the structural change I would hope so because if we genuinely start to think about wow what can young people how do they um, how do we assess what they know and can do and how they learn and how do we bring that into the classroom from outside the classroom not just make it classroom bound I do start to think that gives us some signals about a new way of learning and teaching um, and also engagement beyond the school gates. Mm. And I think like we've spoken a lot about inquiry-based learning as a vehicle so it's to create some of those links for classroom educators and break down some of those barriers and I think sometimes if you're unfamiliar with inquiry-based learning in that space it can seem like quite an overwhelming um, task to, to transform your existing curriculum into that pedagogy but I think what's really interesting is the more schools I work with and the more educators I work with there's lots of really small transitions you can make from your existing curriculum to make it more real world like changing your task question so that students are taking on a role like that exists in the real world so as an entrepreneur or as an engineer or as a doctor or as a project manager um, you know it was one small vehicle and then obviously creating those tasks that connect to organizations perhaps that are also giving the project for the students to embark on you know these are things that without changing the school bell times or you know the assessment that's being done in 11 and 12 um, or, you know, some of those really challenging barriers that are removable for the classroom educator, small shifts that can be made in the classroom that really make a world of difference for young people. Um, Lynn has made a comment as well. So the organisation and structure of schools can be reframed when you look at the school's values and beliefs around students and their learnings. Using these shared values and beliefs can provide a lens to question what has always been and do things differently. That's such a great point, Lynn. And I think even asking that question, you know, what do we value here? And I haven't walked into a school where that hasn't been answered by a school saying well-being or school saying, you know, our young people having pathways post, you know, their school experience or that they're contributing to society or even something as simple as they're happy. And yet the way that we measure um, and how we structure our assessment instruments are in complete contradiction to the values and beliefs. So doing a little bit of mapping around those things can be a really powerful um, opportunity for schools to almost reflect on where they're going. Um, Jan, I'd love to finish with one question because I think we could talk all day, but if, if you're a teacher listening to this, um, what would be some of your hot tips around maybe books that people can lean into or podcasts that they can listen to or perhaps organisations um, or people that they can follow if they just want to be immersed in, in this sort of future of work um, language modelling and, and gain a greater understanding of what they can be doing in the classroom? Um, yes, well, that's great, Nick. Um, first of all, and following on what Lynn has um, popped in 
the chat. Um, I do think the kind of recognition of learning for all um, paper uh, from Learning Creates Australia, led by Sandra Milligan and the team at um, Melbourne University, is a must read. Um, it talks to those com the component parts of a new recognition system um, of which learning ambitions and that kind of values and beliefs is really core. So um, kind of if you want to deep dive into what is really important. Um, I really do love um, some of our local heroes at the moment. So Adriano and Phil with Game Changers, um, Luca Parry with This Learning Life. I think there's some great podcasts out and about. Um, my favourite um, newsletters are a little bit from different places and people. I get James Clear's newsletter every single week, which is pretty a newsletter um, that talks about some of the global areas of the world um, and of course the New Work Bites podcast is excellent and um, I think there's a lot of really great uh, educators but also I always go and this is my top tip for for uh, educators is go look beyond kind of education look at design fantastic design thinking leaders around the world um, there was a there was a program in Melbourne that's all on LinkedIn now where there was a global design um, gathering of some of the best design thinkers human-centered design thinkers around the world go and look at all those talks um, I always dive into dangerous ideas at, from Sydney um, I just try to get as much as I can from the external kind of other industries other sectors other players and then bring that into my kind of thinking so um yeah i hope they're i hope they're all of interest nick some of those anyway to people plenty of amazing things for people to dig into um jan look a thank you would would be an underwhelming way uh to to finish this off but for me and everybody else that has the opportunity to engage today thank you for your time and also the incredible body of work um, that you're doing behind the scenes and in front of the scenes for education. Um, I know there'll be lots for people to take away from this and be able to move forward in their own classroom. So thanks for joining us and thanks for sharing a little bit of your work now and, and some places that people can go to find out more. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everybody. And um, if you're interested in obviously jumping in for our next live learning series, um, we have a cracker coming up and it's going to be on Wednesday, the 10th of March. It'll be the same time. Um, and we've actually got two absolute weapons um, from the American education space talking to us about project based and inquiry based learning. So um, you're welcome. We'll obviously share all of these across our socials, these key dates, but um, to stay in the loop, um, we'd love for you to join our mailing list and you can do so by heading to futureanything.com. Um, we send out fortnightly newsletters that have got podcast interviews and also great conversations with incredible change makers and also lots of resources that you can take straight from our newsletter and into your classroom as well. Um, for the entire team behind the scenes, thank you for your time. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month for our next live learning series. Cheers. <laughs>